that heard we were supposed to be going to San Francisco um, to present this at the Craft Chocolate Experience. And because of social distancing, this was canceled, so we rescheduled it to go online. Um, and so we're recording it because it will be posted for, there's a, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to see it, but a whole, we did a whole online festival called Stay Home with Chocolate over the last week. Um, so if you want to hear from a ton of different chocolate makers and see like factory tours and farm tours and hear stories from origins, then um, that's a that's a great place to go shopping with about 100 makers or so. And uh, so this is being recorded for that. Um, you are welcome to you can your turn your videos on or off. You can do whatever. Um, if you want to ask questions, uh, just go ahead and shoot them in the chat. Vanessa's really amazing. So introducing Vanessa Lee. She's a friend of mine from Seattle that is totally expert. She's a she's part of my small group at my church, and we've been doing online small group for the last several weeks, and so she's agreed to help me figure this out. Um, so yeah, just shoot her a question and she can interrupt me or you're welcome to as well. Um, I want this to be interactive, but I also realize as we get, we'll probably have about 20 people with us. So um, I also realize some people might be a little bit shy to ask questions or interrupt if that's the case. Um, so anyway, um, so welcome. I will um, get started then, and I don't know how to, let's see, yeah, okay. Can everyone see my screen okay? I'm assuming that's a yes? Okay, so um, to, <laughs> to start, and let me know if the sound cuts out as well. Um, if any of you guys are having trouble with sounds, just to let you know, I know um, sometimes at night with with everybody streaming videos now these days, I've seen it, sometimes it's helpful to call in via the phone instead of do the online audio if it starts to delay or cut in or out. So um, just heads up on that. We're hoping my, my audio stays with us. So um, this picture is a picture of Ruth and she is the very first cocoa farmer, female cocoa farmer I ever met. She's out of Indonesia, and um, this was back in 2013 when um, we were driving through the back area. Her, her farm is a little bit removed, and um, she was showing me this prized tree because you can see all of these different pods. Normally, you wouldn't have, you know, 20 pods ripening at once on a tree, so I wanted to to brag on her a little bit because that's where I got my start was with her. Um, as I get started, I do just want to let you know, just throw the caveats out there. So I am not, you know, a, a researcher or um, a, an anthropologist or anything like that. So these are going to be very personal observations, not necessarily data backed of, in any way. Um, there, I will be making some generalizations, but it is my desire to honor cultural context. And so um, if something comes across as not that way, just please forgive me. It wasn't my intention. <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate the, the cultures and the, the communities that we're working within and don't mean to say anything that might be taken as, as criticism or um, is anything less than honoring. So anyway, this is a this is a fun photo actually from the last trip that I made to Honduras and when we were going out on collection, which you'll see a few more videos on um, momentarily. And she was one of the, um, in Honduras in particular. There are very few uh, female cacao farmers, so she was one of the few that I met out on collection that day. Um, just to give you, I think a lot of you have heard my background already, but just to give you a little bit of context, um, my I got started back in 2009 when I read a book called Not For Sale, and uh, I started reading about bonded labor and really wanted to do something about it and had prayed and asked the Lord if that would be something that um, I could use my business skills to help come up with solutions for. And 
uh, a few months later, in fact, uh, my friend April, who's on the phone with us tonight, asked me if I knew that uh, that if that if I had heard that 40% of chocolate has slave labor somewhere in the supply chain, and I realized that's quite a round number and probably not accurate, but it got my mind going that uh, not accurate. I mean, it was an inflated oh, number, bad. but um, no. the oh, got. Any number. Okay. Um, ID. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. We just had that. We had some, still having some sound issues all of a sudden. Is anyone else getting feedback? Or is it? Uh, it's uh, mute. Oh. We were trying to mute for somebody. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Vanessa. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, that definitely sent me on a journey of thinking, wow, maybe it's cacao, maybe it's chocolate. I've always been a chocolate lover my whole life. And I was hearing about what was going on with this and realizing, you know, a lot, you can try to tackle bonded labor with, with legislation and with um, advocacy and all of that is important, but ultimately those are business problems and business needs to take the lead in solving it. And so that was, kind of how we got started in it. Um, so shortly thereafter, I, uh, or a few years later, I should say, not shortly thereafter, in 2013, um, I landed in Indonesia to do an internship. And this is a picture from the working group um, from the Cocoa Sustainability Partnership. And while I was there, we were um, going after a really big goal of sustainably doubling cocoa production by the year 2020, which is amazing to say that now because then it felt so far away and here we are. Um, so that group was looking at all of the possibilities and at the time, um, the the statistics that was being thrown around was that cacao farmers earned about a quarter of a living wage. And we were talking about doubling yields, which best case scenario would get farmers halfway to a living wage. And so I just knew there was a lot more work that needed to be done. And that is still, you know, increasing yields, increasing pricing is still absolutely one of the fastest ways to improve farmer income, but really we need to be doing more. Um, particularly when you look at, and these, these again, these statistics are being presented just to, to show the magnitude of the challenge, not as a criticism to the industry, but for instance, only 7% of even fair trade farmers in the Ivory Coast earn what's considered to be a living income, and those are fair trade farmers. And, and even of that, and these were studies done by fair trade, 42% of their farmers are earning above the lowest um, living, like minimum wage, fair wage. It's, it's, you know, so it's still less than half are even able to make a living income off of the cocoa they're growing. Um, I'm going to just, here we go. Um, moreover, farmers, if, if you look at the statistics and the way the pricing trends have gone, they're earning 27% less than they were even 40 years ago. And those are not in inflation adjusted prices. Those are, those are real. Um, and we're paying five times more for chocolate. So you can see the farmers are just getting squeezed more and more on the front end. Um, and there are real costs in, you know, in the transportation and then the people that get the product distributed around the world. But the reality is, is that, you know, we're paying five times more, they're earning 27% less. And so there's a big differential there. Um, and, you know, if any of us were earning 27% less than we were 40 years ago, we would know something's wrong. Um, just to put it in perspective, cocoa farmers earn about, about 6% of the wholesale price that usually translates into just over 3% of the retail price. So there's, there's a lot of room in that collective pie um, for them to earn more income and, and um, we hope uh, be able to progress in, in a greater portion of that. And just as, a, as an aside too, because of the way cacao has um, grown around the, the world, you know, it was quote unquote discovered in um, 
by Spain in the 1500s in Central America. And then when um, both the, when they brought it back to Europe um, from the new world, and then again with industrialization, in both of those situations, um, a taste for cacao and chocolate grew and the, the cocoa was then planted in um, primarily West Africa, but then also in Southeast Asia in colonized areas. And so they didn't have a culture of eating cacao. Um, and so in a lot of these places, and, and even in Honduras, you know, now they're just rediscovering um, a, a culture for cacao and chocolate that was lost um, in the years that, you know, it became kind of more of this um, export commodity crop versus something that they enjoy locally. Um, so when you've got a situation where farmers aren't earning a lot of income, where they're not able to make a living wage out of it, what often happens is they will um, go to the cities to find work. And often what happens in that case, it's the men that go and the women and the children stay behind because they're, they're making short term term decisions in terms of um, where they can find more income to really provide for their family. It also means too um, that they are, the men when they migrate to the city often are, um, the, the families are falling apart under that pressure. You'll see, um, I, I show this picture here, it's a little bit, it might be a little bit hard for you to see, this is a meeting um, in a cacao farming community in Ecuador um, back in 2014 when I was there. And what you'll see is that it's all women and children. In this particular community, um, almost all of the men were going into main cities to get work. And um, so this was the, the de demographic of the community that was left. Um, Additionally, if they are staying behind, um, often what happens is, you know, with the price fluctuations that are happening in cacao, um, if there's a year that they're just, it doesn't look like they're going to get a lot of money, they might not harvest at all, or they're going to reduce their cost to the bare minimum. They're not going to invest um, in maintaining their farm. And then, of course, the, the yields continue to go down. Um, so there's, there's a lot of challenges if they're not being paid. Um, and just as an aside, it's not super easy for them to be able to change um, change crops. For uh, for instance, if they're planting cacao, it takes about five years for cacao to uh, to produce. And so, for instance, you know, in 2013, 2014, cacao prices were a little bit higher than they are today. Like if someone had planted then you know, they would have only been seeing their yields in 18, 19 when the prices were significantly lower. Well, they've made this investment. Those trees are going to produce for the next 10 to 20 years. They can't just easily pull up all those trees and pay to like plant another crop and wait another four to five years. And so, so really once this, this, the crop is planted, they're, they're committed They're So it's whatever the, whatever the, they're taking they they have to take the, the price that's being offered to them a lot of times. And so then it literally is just a, a, a decision on whether or not it's worth the harvest and worth the work. Um, before I move on, I just want to check any questions or I want to make space for that because we're going to move into an, a new topic. You good? All right. Okay. So um, when I talk about empowering women, I just want to point out that it is still, uh, it's really about a partnership between men and women. Um, men are absolutely critical to the process and they have been critical the whole time. Even now, um, when you're talking about com exporting commodity cacao, um, most of the, the steps in that chain that are happening are are led by men up to that point and I'll get into that a little bit uh, more later but um, what is amazing about this is this is the visit I recently made to Cacao Verapaz in Guatemala and um, you can see the, 
one of their workers there. This warehouse, um, each of these bags is about 100 to 150 pounds, and you can see there's there's no forklift anywhere. Um, this gentleman here is the one that's stacking every single bag and then climbing up on these bags to put those bags on top and, and keep the warehouse organized and stacked. So, um, so that's definitely something that would be very difficult for a woman uh, to, to do. I, I can speak from experience. I threw my back out last year on a, a, trying, to, trying to lift one of our boxes and they're not even nearly as heavy as these bags. So um, it's definitely heavy weights that they're dealing with, but they do a lot of the transport. And um, in terms of the, the way you think of, or we tend to think about agricultural communities. Um, so there's cash crops. Those are things that like coffee and cacao, um, other crops that are nuts often that, that are being grown to export to another country um, versus staple crops would be things that they're eating in their own gardens. You know, that would be like corn, cassava, um, you know, whatever it happens to be in the different areas that rice in Indonesia. Um, so, so it typically separates out that the men do the cash crops and the women do the staple crops, the things that feed the family. Ooh. My computer stuck. Okay, so um, this is, if this video doesn't play, we're, we're going to, have Vanessa, or actually, I'm going to pass over to Vanessa now to show you a little bit of the typical supply chain, or yeah, the typical journey that cacao takes from um, from the farming areas to the processors. So, Vanessa, are you able to show your screen now? Do I need to pass it over to you? I can't hear you. Okay, so what you see there is, uh, here, we're just going to, do you mind pausing real quick, Vanessa? Yep. There you um, go. I just wanted to, oh, there we go. Oh, now I can hear you too. Hello. Um, so those, so what, I went out on a, here, let's, yeah, let's pause it for a minute. Um, so I just wanted to give you the context of, of what I wanted to show you. So what typically happens in cacao growing communities, um, because a lot of people don't have transport, they don't have trucks, there, there aren't ways, and I'll get into that a little bit more, um, to, get, to easily get the cacao to a main facility. And so what you just saw was um, a team of two guys in particular, but there were four of us total that went and me, I was useless in terms of lifting any of these bags that went out to collect what you're seeing in the back of that truck in the course of a day. Um, so, so as you see that video, so each bag is weighed by the guys and then picked up and put into a feeder truck in this case. So often, um, so this is another one that's going out into, thank you, Vanessa. So into a feeder truck, so that pickup truck, is what we'll take to that bigger truck that we were about to see. Um, and that is about, they picked up probably 300 of those bags um, farm by farm over the course of a day. So that by the end was overnight, we finished it about two in the morning. And then we bring the cacao beans into the fermentation facility. Um, so what you're seeing now are the beans from the bags being dumped down in. Um, that's about 40,000 pounds of what is called wet cacao. And the wet cacao are the, the pods that are, so we'll go ahead and pause here, Vanessa. Um, so the, the wet pods, they're quite heavy, um, and so you harvest what was, let's see, 
I should, should have had my pictures ready. Anyway, you heart, so cacao pods are about this big. You open them with mallets. You can see, you can see photos on um, our uh, YouTube for this as well, but on a separate playlist. Um, so the, the pods are harvested. They're grown in the trees like they were at the beginning when you saw the picture of Ruth. Um, brought in in like buckets and bags and whatever, you know, whatever container the farmers have to bring to the area. And um, as they're loaded into the fermentation facility, so all of the pickup will be men and I'll, I'll get into actually, I'm going to go back to share my screen and show you kind of a little bit more about what's uh, some of the other ways that it gets there. Let's see if this will work. Forgive me for, here we go. Okay, so um, the last mile is, is incredible as you can imagine because cacao farms are super rural. You've got usually farmers have one to five hectares of land it may or may not be where their house is located um, and so they're farming land that you know might have been in their family for generations or um, they for whatever reason it's, it's generally not because it's farmland it's generally not along main roads and so you can see um, this was just one day of collection we had some of it coming in on horses and donkeys Others, you can imagine those really big, heavy bags coming in with, on somebody's motorbike. Um, and that's not an uncommon way to see the cacao come. Um, and that's why that's, there's the portable scale and then the pickup truck. And so this is the size of the road. You can see behind this guy here, um, the road isn't big enough for that big truck that was collecting all of it that came into the fermentation facility. Um, so that, so there's this feeder truck that goes out, empties out, and then goes back to these back roads. And when I say back roads, I mean the, the, the maximum you can drive on these roads is probably five miles per hour. It is incredibly difficult driving, incredibly difficult work. And on top of that, you can see in this last picture here, um, this is a really steep vertical hill. There is no way to get the cacao up, you know, by motorbike, probably even by horse, this was super steep. So someone carried it by hand, those 100, 100 pound bags. And if you think about the effort that goes into the, the farmers are getting about per wet pound of cacao, I think it ends up being 40 cents. So they've, they've, managed to take care of those pods for the pods take about four to five months to grow on the trees they're tending the trees the whole time then they're doing the labor to open the pods carrying the the wet cacao to a place where it can then be purchased and um, this is incredibly hard work and all the while meantime it's you know 80 90 degrees out with high humidity it's it's hot it's sticky there's you know they're all organic farmers too so it's a lot of bugs this is definitely um it's hard hard work and i after having seen that collection and seen these guys you know pick up forty thousand pounds of it in a day i was i was blown away by the amount of work so i i say all that just because I don't, when I talk about empowering women in farming communities, I don't want to discount what the men are doing at all because their work is incredibly important and incredibly hard too, and not stuff that, that women could do easily as well. So that said, um, back to kind of the bigger picture. Now we're back in Indonesia. And um, so this was, this meeting here happened around the time that we were doing the working groups and I was like, okay, they're a quarter of a living wage. We're going to double their income. They're going to get halfway to a living wage. What else can we do? And um, I sat in on this meeting and if you see, so this, these are just the presenters up front right here. So there's about like what, you know, like 12 or more 
guys. And this was the meeting where I sat in a room with hundreds of people. And um, one of the speakers said, ladies and gentlemen, and then had to correct himself because he realized I was the only lady in the room. Um, you've just seen evidence as to why um, cocoa farming would not be predominantly female, but um, it it's just definitely a very, very strong uh, thread through, through cacao farming and through the supply chain up to now. But I asked, what if the farmers did most more of their own processing? And so that was the idea that I came to Indonesia with uh, when I returned back in 2014. And I approached a group uh, or the, the, uh, co-op that we now work with, the leaders of Kupton Mesagena. And I said, hey, I've got this idea. I think I want to do something out of a whole shell cacao bean. Are there a couple of people that can help us, um, help me with this experiment? And women showed up to help. And I was completely stunned. And I was, I just was racking my brain as to why would this be? Like, I've only met Ru Ruth up to now. And granted, she is from that community. But I was just realizing that, wow, when we move from farming to food production, we move from what's culturally men's work to culturally women's work. And that was a huge aha for me because I didn't, when we went into this, I wasn't thinking, how do we empower women in the cacao supply chain? I was just thinking, how do we get more income in the communities that are growing cacao? Because what's happening right now doesn't appear to be sustainable, even, even if we're able to increase the yield. So that was a super exciting thing to see that, that happen. Um, and so now, five year, you know, fast forward five years, I'm learning a lot about uh, from our co-ops in particular, so I just want to take a step back and honor those two co-ops real quick. You'll see a lot of um, pictures that I post on our social media channels and um, and have over the years. Uh, both Koptan Masagena in Indonesia and Kwagrisal in Honduras um, are exceptional in that they have really... Um, on their own, wanted to develop more uh, value-added activities beyond just growing cacao. Um, in Indonesia, for instance, when I met them, they had already uh, been making some of their own chocolate. They had opened two, no, at that point, one um, chocolate cafe where they were already serving um products made from their own cacao that was grown locally there. And that um, in Indonesia in particular, they already had a group of entrepreneurial women that they'd been working with. Likewise, Coagvixal, when I met them in Honduras and was introduced to that group, it was because they were looking for ways to invest in women locally. And, um, and again, had, you know, had already started in motion the plans in place to make their own chocolate. They hadn't at that point. So that's been really fun to see actually that, that evolution from 2016, when I first started, when I first met them, to see them um, last year, they, uh, they finished their chocolate factory, and they're in the final stages of getting all the certifications for that for selling internationally. But so, so I want to to point out that um, yes, the there are some kind of natural divisions of labor, and at the same time, these two groups that we work with happen to be quite progressive in that regard, in the way that they're employing women, le uh, raising them up in leadership, and um, so some of these things, if you were to visit some other areas, it. A lot of these things in this both column um, probably would still be with the men. Just, uh, just to point that out. So, so men, you know, typically, and even in these communities, obviously collection and warehousing with all of the weight bearing activity, that's going to be primarily men. Um, additionally, um, transportation in rural areas, in particular, uh, family. A lot of times, families don't have multiple. Um, cars or motorbikes or whatever. So it's um, in Indonesia, there are 
a couple of the gals that have cars or access to cars and drive. In Honduras, um, I know there there are fewer um, where it's, you know, one or two have motorbikes, very few drive. Most of them take public transportation. Um, other divisions, so, you know, pricing often is handled by the men, banking, you know, anything having to do with machines, drying again, um, will we can we can get into those videos time permitting um there i drying is again a very manual process and and tends to be pretty heavy heavy weights as well um and fermentation you saw actually we can move back to the video now um vanessa if you want to Let's see if we can move back to Vanessa's screen. I can show what, yeah, so this is fermentation. So this is um, typically what happens is the the beans will, when you saw them unloaded before, so the women and the men share this, this activity um, because there's, and basically what happens is for seven days, the beans are fermented and for the first 24 or 48 hours, I'm sorry, they are, um, they rest and then they get turned from day to day because that's what allows the flavors to develop in the cacao and you have to so you can see them cover it late i feel like they're putting tucking them in and putting them back to sleep um, and so then this is a fermentation cut test and what this determines is um, how well developed the flavors in the cacao are becoming and so they're sorting them you'll see some lighter beans up front um, some the the front right is the more purple beans and then in the back were the um, brown beans. Um, so those were how those were being sorted. And then there's a drying video that, uh, here, we'll pause that. I'm gonna, oops, can I, how do I take back? I'm back, am I back? Okay, let me see if I can get you to the final video, which is the drying video. Oh, I, I forgot. It was on Instagram. Never mind. It's not important. Um, so anyway, so fermentation is something because you're moving much smaller weights, you know, they're trying to stir the beans as it goes. Quality control, um, that was the cut test so obviously those are things that can be done by women nursery and grafting that is an interesting thing so when the plants are babies and they're small um or they're so what what a plant i mean as you guys know when you go to plant nurseries here it's very similar but you might have um it's very common to see women tending you know thousands of seedlings that then will be um given to co-op uh co-op members to plant in their on their farms uh, because all of this with with farming you know much like you probably are familiar with in the u.s where there's specific clones specific um, seeds that are distributed that's the same thing with cacao and so they'll plant the seeds that are best for their area um, with the right uh, the right flavor profiles that they're looking for the right the the right seeds for their climate um, in addition, you know, reporting and small purchases, managing people, those are the types of things that both men and women um, do quite easily. And then what you'll typically see only women doing, and this is the case in most of the, the areas where I've been, um, a lot of them will be doing the sorting, particularly when you're talking about um, either sorting dried beans once they once they've been processed or even sorting wet beans and getting out like when you open a pod sometimes there's you know just as it, when you open a piece of fruit there might be part that's damaged or something like that and the women will pull out the the bad stuff and only make sure that the good beans get into the buckets or the bags whatever's being delivered to the fermentation facility additionally they're they're the ones do i've i've yet to see um a man cleaning any of the facilities doing the cooking very rarely um and then a lot of the precision work and that's where really when you start talking about the the work that we do with snacking cacao with the the shelling of the cacao beans it's almost always women that are doing it and even the times that guys have showed up um 
the women are typically better at the work and so and the guys find that they're they're not as quick with it and they're not as is ha, don't have as delicate as of a touch so their quality isn't quite as high and so the women tended to do a lot more of that precision type of work um so yeah so that's the those are the typical divisions of labor but what's fun is that when you start to talk about okay so who's making your chocolate um even when you start moving into factories uh you'll see that in this case, almost all of the staff of Coagricel, uh, there, there are a few men on staff, but this is the predominant staff for our partner group in Honduras, and this is at their new factory. So it is women that are making your chocolate, and you'll find that in most cases, um, whether you're in Indonesia or other places that I visited, even um, when I showed that picture of Guatemala a few slides back, um, when I met that co-op um, which is a much smaller co-op just about 50 people um, it was the women that were wanting to make the chocolate uh, and and had secured a, a small machine to do so hey Kim did They're you have all, slides at yeah. this point oh are they not showing no I didn't realize that you were <laughs> I'm sorry slides. here let's uh how do I show them same way uh go back to the share on the bottom Oh, it's, I've lost it. Let's see. Thanks, Eric, for pointing Sorry that out. Sorry about that. <laughs> You're like, where, where, what are you? Now can you see? Yep. Thank you. Okay, here. So I that don't know if you want to, I don't know if you want to backtrack yeah, to any me, of the ones you missed. So did you, you guys have seen it before, but I was just talking a lot and it's just an eye chart. So I apologize. Um, so I, yeah, so it was just, this is who's making your chocolate. Um, and also making uh, your bonbons and your snacking cacao. Actually, I'll just go back one slide. So, so the bonbons are mostly made by Elisa here and Alejandra. Can you guys see my arrow when I point at things? I can't tell. Yes. Maybe or maybe not. Yes. Okay. Perfect. And then, um, and then the snacking cacao is uh, the lead person for that is Melvia here. So um, a few things to keep in mind, though, as we start to draw women out of the home into the labor force, um, the the reality of of work. This is you know typically in rural areas where a lot of them are first generation working outside of the home. So there is some some con uh, there are considerations that go into that. So. Um, they're living multi-generationally. This is actually a selfie we took with the, the family that I stay with uh, while I'm in Honduras. So this is the mom and then the, uh, the daughter-in-law, daughter, a cousin, and then um, two of the grandkids. So they're living multi-generationally. And um, again, you know, some of the traditions of the, the community, the women are doing all of the meal prep. Um, with with often very limited appliances and housewares, um, the kitchen you know uh, the kitchens are a lot smaller. The the prep space is smaller, and there's a and there's typically more people to feed, as you can see. They're doing all the childcare and the healthcare. They're also in this case um, growing their own food, um, some of the in their garden, uh, keeping chickens. The uh, doing a lot of that type of staple work um, and you know things aren't coming if they're going to the market because again I mentioned that they don't have transport as much um, they're not going to the market more than once a week if that um, because if you're living in a rural area the markets generally aren't that close they also they do have multiple income streams though it is this is a particularly entrepreneurial family and that what you can't see is just kind of off to the right here is a small store that they operate out of the front of their house. And um, what, but what this does mean is, for instance, uh, Luz here, uh, the, the mother of the house, when I was staying there in Honduras, I was there nearly six weeks this last trip, and she left the house twice that whole time. 
so it gives you kind of a feel for um, how you know just how different life is there and and the level of responsibility in the home that that women are taking on so there's very little time for exercise or self care um, so some as we approach that then it's how do you and we, we think, how do we empower women in farming communities? A lot of it really is around um, de-risking uh, business opportunities for them. In both cases, the co-ops that we work with actually employ the women to make the snacking cacao. So they bring them in um, at either, either they're employed full-time already, and this is an additional source of income, or um, or they're bringing additional people in, in the case of Honduras, well, both in both situations, they're bringing additional people in to process cacao for us during the harvest. Um, there was a third group that we were working with that was associated with a co-op, but trying to do the work on their own. And um, with the licenses involved and the things like that, like it, it became too risky for the women for the investment that was needed. And um, so it is giving them the ability to do the work where they're earning a wage rather than having to, to risk um, putting money in that they probably don't have set aside and then hoping to get a return. Even if it is a you know more of a guaranteed return like what we were talking about, it was it was just really difficult for them to do. And so, also because women tend to have less access to capital or have financial experience, you know it's not a given, particularly in these areas that we're talking that they have bank accounts. Um, when we did the collection um, run that I was talking about, that where we pulled the forty thousand pounds of cacao. Um, about a third of those farmers aren't banked. So um, it means that that they're, they have to go into an office um, after the cacao has been collected because you don't want to carry, for obvious reasons, carry cash to pay all the farmers when you're out on a truck that people know you're collecting. So the farmers then need to go, go pick up cash for that. But so th all that said, um, women may not have, you know, they may not be banked, they may not have the access to financial capital or even the experience to manage a business. And so really coming alongside them to help de-risk that is huge. Um, additionally, helping with transport. We've seen that both in Indonesia and in Honduras. Um, in Indonesia in particular, we, we were really having to to work through how to get the cacao to the women because the women weren't in the same place with the ferment where the fermentation facility was. And that was a large portion of what we negotiated when we got started was how is that transport going to work? Um, likewise in Honduras, um, when I stay there, we, you know, to get to work, we stand along the side of the road and either there's these share buses that come by or you know if public transportation is closed like it is now when they're working at uh sorry and i'll, I'll touch a little bit on how they've been impacted by covid because i know that's a question that'll probably come up but we have to work then to figure out how to to help the women get to the places to to do the processing um and because you know, when you're in these rural areas, they're not all going to live right on top of one another. Um, also, flexible work schedules. You know, they're they're take, like as I mentioned, a lot of the child care comes on them, and also um, family care. One of the women, you know, we've been WhatsApping back and forth, and a few of the women have aging parents that they're taking care of as well. And so it is difficult when um, when something comes up, the the expectation is that the woman will stay home. So having flexibility around those schedules is, is critically important. Um, and then investing in their homes. And that was, that was something that came as a surprise. We approached this past trip, we approached our partners in Honduras about reinvesting a portion of our revenues in their local community. And we brought the women together and asked them, well, what what do you want to invest in? And um, 
the the co-op had also never asked the women this and so none of us really knew what to expect and uh the resounding answer that came back was invest in um, home improvement projects um so from getting cement to lay a cement floor where there wasn't one before um repairing a the only house the only skin house or um putting an expansion for a growing family, um, particularly when they live multi-generationally, there might not, you know, be space for the second generation or third generation when it comes. So those types of things were really important to them. And, um, and I was trying to unpack what that meant. And I just even I checked with them recently. I said, okay, you know, so for that priority, I think part of why that's important is because when when the women are making the transition and stepping out in a way that the culture where it's unusual that women are going to be working outside of the home, it's important that their families benefit from it. If they're going to be leaving the house, then the, then those home improvement projects are, are a tangible reminder of what she's contributing when she's not there. But it's also oftentimes, and they, they affirm this as well, it's making their lives easier when they are home. As I mentioned, if a lot of the um, house chores are falling on on uh, them when they get home, then it's important that the house is, is in running order um, as much as possible when when they're away. So, uh, so investing in their homes was a much bigger deal than than we realized, and something that can help empower communities. And then also too, starting local. Um, I touched on the fact that you know cacao hasn't been enjoyed culturally, or chocolate hasn't been enjoyed culturally by the places that grow it, um, because it's a cash crop. Um, what happens with being able women you know women we have this desire and you know again we're gonna this is a stereotype and a generalization but we we enjoy feeding people and um so as much as possible when you're enabling or not enabling but when the women are empowered to create something that can be eaten can be enjoyed can be served um, you see much more excitement about that from them um, and much more investment and passion in the work that they're doing when they're able to see and serve um, the community and their families around them. And uh, it was really exciting to see, you know, even uh, uh, Nolvia, the one that, that leads the snacking cacao. We were at a gas station and a local gas station that was selling some of the snacking cacao and I was like, oh my gosh, here it is, you know, and she was, I was like, I need your picture next to it. And she was just beaming, you know, because she knows it's being sold locally. Um, so anyway, so that is something that that is an important feedback loop for the women and for their passion. Um, in terms of in terms of how we as customers can can support women initiatives. Um, looking beyond fair trade and organic to direct trade or long term contracts and both of those. Uh, you, you're starting to see a few more brands that come about and I'll I'll send a little follow up with some specific brands there's. Um, there are some that are made locally, of course, Shoal, uh, which is the, the mark for the group in Honduras and then. Uh, Kokchan Masagana has one called Chocolate Chiloto. Both of those are only sold locally right now. But um, Asanya out of Haiti and um, Belu out of Peru are two brands that are, are actually um, working with women in their communities and then exporting right now to the U.S. And there's also people doing, in addition to Good King, you know, our goal is to produce in the in the farming communities, but we're still working towards that from a food safety perspective. And um, but there's also uh, Askenosi who does direct trade, and also Cool. Um, and I'll show you the the brand names in the end. Um, but but you're starting to see more cacao. Uh, or chocolate brands that are doing direct trade and and specifically focusing on developing women in those communities. But that said, you'll see a picture here of Maisie Jane because 
she's the one that does, she's the head of the company that sells our almonds for our um, cacao, our love blend cacao snack mix. And in that mix, there's Maisie, who she's the fourth generation farmer, but she was the one in her family that initiated um, doing nut butters and other um, value added products from the, the almonds that they were already growing. And then um, the cherry, the dried cherries and the dried blueberries in that love blend as well are also um, female farmers or, and, or a couple where the female is the one that does the value added that makes it into the snack product. Um, so, so it's not just chocolate where that's the case. Oftentimes where you're seeing uh, farmed products turn into food is where you start to see the women come, come into involvement. Uh, women owned businesses, of course, will be a little bit more focused on that. And then if you see, you know, words like handmade, handcrafted, artisan, things like that, that is um, a pretty good tip off that women will be involved in that process as well. So that's, um, the, why that's important. Uh, the 80%, so when you're talking about agricultural cacao, our, our farm groups that we work with already make about double the world market rate just from, you know, having fair trade, organic, rainforest alliance, their certifications, and having direct trade relationships with the people that they work with. But on top of that, um, because of the processing that the women do in the communities right now, they're earning between 50 to 80 percent more. You know, Honduras, in the case of Honduras, which is where this picture is from, they're earning 80 percent more than those prices already. And then um, when when we finish converting, like so, for instance, the snacking cacao that I was telling you about that was sold locally, they're earning nine times more uh, than than just the commodity price when they do that. So there are some, I mean, it's a game changer for these communities to be able to not only earn more income, but be able to enjoy what they're made, the fruits of their labors uh, locally. So uh, that is why it's important, not, not just to bring women into the equation, but just for the entire community to be able to thrive in that way. So these are some of the brands that I was talking about. They Lou out of Excuse me. Kim, we had a quick question uh, here yeah. about the yeah. uh, explaining direct trade versus fair trade, which you kind of touched oh, on. But yeah. That's from Amy. And then um, Valerie jumped in there and said fair trade is pegged to commodity price. Direct trade is working directly with growers. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So that, yeah. So all, I, you could still be, so it could still be both. So yeah, so fair trade, um, to Valerie's point, is typically a premium that's offered. So uh, I'm trying to think, like, how much detail do I want to give? Fair trade, UTS, Rainforest Alliance, those are three marks that, uh, or three brands, that what they do is a certification. And, and they work with farming co-ops, um, which are groups of smallholder farmers, to certify that the farmers are following good labor practices that they're um, that they've been trained, you know, oftentimes with with good agricultural practices they're careful about the environment and things like that as well. They'll typically get about a 10 to 20% premium over the commodity price for that. Now, buyers might well decide to pay more than that. But if they're if they are, um, that's typically something that's negotiated between the co-op and the buyer, and that's when you start moving into direct trade. So, um, so for instance, the in both such, both co-ops that we work with, they're not selling their cocoa to the commodity market, and then I buy it, you know, from the New York Exchange or the London Exchange. We have a direct contract that they're they have direct contracts with other buyers as well. They set their prices specifically and they don't fluctuate with the, with the commodity price. And so direct trade tends to be a lot more consistent pricing. You may have long-term contracts in place. I haven't heard of that happening too much yet, but I hope it goes that direction. 
Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, Amy, or clarifies it all. Yeah. So, um, and then what was the? Sorry, I just figured okay. out how to unmute myself. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then, so there's these other brands as well. And then I'll actually, I think, um, here, let me just touch on these real quick. So I, I mentioned Scania out of Haiti, Belu out of Peru. Um, we have Louisa Abrams. So she is, she's working out of Brazil. Um, she's working with co-ops that aren't, some, some have quite a few women in the supply chain um, or in their co-op. But it's not predominantly, it's, you know, it's both women and men, um, but, you know, a, a woman run organization in the origin that they pull from um, that do some really nice, neat things with wild harvest, um, working with communities there. Rock Bar, I haven't tasted yet, but um, is a newer brand out of the Netherlands that is by women and working specifically with women co-ops. Um, Askinosi has been a favorite of mine for a while, and they have two co two women-led co-ops that they work with, one in Tanzania and one in Ecuador called Amazonia um, is, their, is the origin name for that one. Crew Chocolate, um, they work with various origins as well, um, but they are doing specifically looking at uh, women led cooperatives and working on value added activities and origin as well and then cool is a brand out of um, Canada, but they also are distributed in the US so all of these I think except for rock bar which you know might be coming soon. Um, can be found in the US and and I'll send links to these these brands as well if you want to if you're interested in supporting women initiatives beyond uh, beyond good king of course and then uh for those of you that did order you you've got your samples of shoal already so you saw the people that were um the women in that factory photo were the ones that made your your chocolate pieces that you received in the mail so that's that's it now i'll open to questions but i did just want to there we do also have i think julie yeah um wanted to call you out real quick because you guys are doing some stuff in origin um so i have julie goring is that how you pronounce your last name julie are you able to unmute hi kim yes hi hi here let me turn my my computer put my video back on yeah yeah can you hear me Yep, we can now. So you guys are doing some stuff with women in origin as well, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean we we definitely have women in our in our projects in Nicaragua. Um, um we work with about twelve hundred farmers, both women and men. Um, but actually we're looking to partner to do a very specific all women um project in the future. But we right now we don't have it like just only with women we work with both cool. yeah yeah we have I a love few chocolate all, make i love all the brands that you showed you know i um had the chance to go to chicoa right before cce and i met the founder of rock bar and i tasted oh, their good. chocolate you said you didn't have a chance to taste it and it's delicious it was really good oh good yeah they're, awesome. they're doing some interesting stuff so that's so awesome that that you shared all these different brands yeah so i hope to taste it soon yeah we're gonna have to partner on a project i think um i, I think so yeah i think that would be awesome cool well thank you thank you for that and then um we also have a few other chocolate makers on so um jim and maureen are on from arizona we've got valerie who's been involved in chocolate for a while and um so now it's totally open to any questions that anybody wants to ask um i turned my screen off and have at it we've got let's see 
Got one from Valerie to everybody. Do you think there is any chance the men will help with meals, household chores, or the community seeming not to budge in gender defined roles? I think that's a great question. Um, I have not, I mean, I think that's gonna really vary family by family. I've seen some some families in particular where where literally we'll be working late into the night while I'm there and um, and the men are hanging out and um, the women are still responsible even though we're still working to serve stop serve the serve the men and then go back to work um, and then in other cases we've seen you know where particularly I think a little bit more in Honduras we're starting to see um, some shared shared responsibilities at home and um, so I think it's just you know it's just family by family as as they work those things out um, Christy you asked a question you mentioned that you were going to let us know about the impact oh right thank you thank you for the reminder there so um, COVID uh, I've been hearing from the, the farmer groups a lot more as a result of it. Um, the in Honduras, they now have it's 141 cases, so not too many, but it's a pretty small population. Um, and they in particular are on the main highway for the, the international highway that is where this co-op is located. So um, they are on lockdown and in Honduras, in fact, you have to um, get government approval just to drive right now. And even if you are able to drive, then you have checkpoints along the way where they stop you, you the driver and all the passengers get out of the car and they're spraying them down with some sort of mist. Um, and then they can get in and go back on. But all the public transportation is closed. Um, all the public meetings and events are closed. Um, Indonesia, similar in the, I, I mean, I'm not sure what's going on. I, I've seen varying news stories in terms of Jakarta and Makassar. The, um, the island that we work on is called South or called Sulawesi and um, the state that they're in is South Sulawesi. They've had a, few, a couple of cases, but not near their local community. And they're a little bit more off the beaten path. Um, they are all home from, from school and public gatherings as well. Um, and they are not going out much at all right now. Um, so, but so far everybody's been safe. Um, obviously when you're talking about rural areas, the, the access they have to the medical care that we count on here is, is extremely limited. And so um, for instance, in Indonesia, the, the near, if there were any significant complications at all, um, they would need to take about a 10 hour bus ride to get to the next, the nearest main city, which is Makassar. Um, and the, in Honduras, they're, they're just a couple hours away from the main city, but it's still like the local, the local clinic certainly wouldn't be able to handle that. Um, okay, so another one from Amy to everyone on the consumption and market demand side, what needs to happen for Good King and other similar companies to increase sales? What are the hindrances? Um, so I think it's probably two different questions. I think for, for Good King in particular, I think it's, it's more around educating people what, what snacking cacao is, what, um, because most people think it's, still think it's a coffee bean. Um, and so there's, there's some education, not only around the work that we do in the communities, but also what the product is. I think for other companies to increase sales, um, a lot of the, so when you're talking about empowering women in the farming communities or even paying fair wages, a lot of those, um, the prices of the chocolate are higher. And um, so 
in terms of consumption and market demand, we need to be willing to pay, you know, four or $5 for a chocolate bar is really going to be the place where you're starting to see um, the total cost of the, uh, the communities being closer to that living wage that we were talking about. Um, now, having said that, I'm going to see if we can call, I'm going to call on um, some other experts that we have on the phone. So I invite at this point, either Valerie or Maureen and Jim to, to pipe in there as to what you think as well, because you guys are more in the chocolate space. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Valerie. I think I managed to unmute. <laughs> yes. Kim, I am, I am so energized by your talk, and I've been snacking on strength, and I'm feeling the power and the energy, so thank you for all of this. And yeah, to your point and to Amy's question, I know that you're spot on, Kim, and it's education and just sort of bringing up that learning curve. You know, when I was a kid, I remember coffee was like this 50-cent beverage that smelled weird and the parents drank, and now coffee is this, you know, multi-gazillion dollar $5 latte, $10 venti, whatever it might be, industry. So chocolate is, gosh, maybe going to take a similar path. Um, uh, but, but what happened for that to happen in coffee, a lot of it was education, it was flavor knowledge, it was environmental impact understanding, and so much of the work that you're doing is, is directly to that. So just final kind of word on that. Sometimes when people say, oh my goodness, Valerie, why is this chocolate bar $10? I'll say, yeah, I hear you. You know, how much was the bottle of wine that you had with dinner last night? And they'll say, oh, yeah. Yeah, 20, 25, 15, 197. And I'll ask, well, you know, how long did that bottle of wine last? Hour. <laughs> and so you can get the best chocolate bar in the world for $10, as Sean Askinosi says. So a little bit of perspective, I think, too, is sometimes what it takes. So thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. No, and that is, I mean, I think, you know, I think if more people saw all of the, the steps involved and the fact that all of those were manual steps, you know, from the harvest, you saw, you know, just the, the little that they're getting when they get the cacao beans to the, the side of the road. And then, you know, all the fermentation, that's another week and then another um the week and a half of drying and every step along the way, I didn't, I didn't get into that too much, but, you know, those those cacao lots to get the quality of the cacao that we're getting um they're really tended not only at the farm level but then you know the post harvest and everything that's like day in and day out the people that are managing it it's absolutely a full-time job and so the the artistry that goes into that I, I, if people could see all that that is i feel like they would realize that it is, yeah, that chocolate is worth paying the same thing that you would for a, for a nice bottle of wine. Um, so, so certainly education. And I think also just um, getting it in, you know, and I don't know how to do this practically other than just continuing to, to sell it, but getting it into people's mouths. If you've tasted side by side, the difference between, um, some of these craft chocolate bars are the brands that I shared and the ones that we can, you know, easily find at a grocery store. It is the difference between just kind of like a, a, a soda pop or a cheap beer, you know, moving into, you know, just this really exquisite experience. And so, um, you know, that, that certainly plays into it too, is having, having people be able to taste it. But I, I do want to see, and we might have other chocolate people on the phone too, because I don't know everybody that's joined us. So feel free to pipe in, but Jim and Maureen, anything to add? Hi, can you, can you hear me? This is Jim. We can. Right, hang on, hang on. I'm going to try to do the video thing too. So let's see if it's ah. Yeah, right there. <laughs> All right. So well done. You need to open it though. I know we haven't opened it yet. We brought it home to try it. But it looks it looks beautiful. Now we learn more about it too. The uh, the almonds, right, and the cherries and the blueberries. Oh, all the but women. I, I was listening to Valerie, and I thought there's no way I could follow that with the enthusiasm and, and and everything you said, Valerie. So 
I, I'm not sure we have much to add. I mean, it is, you know, it is education. It is putting the chocolate in people's mouths. And, you know, as a chocolate maker, one of the things that we've done a lot um, and we're trying to do Hi, more. more oh, she's not in. <laughs> hey, this is the boss right here. Everybody. So <laughs> it's, it is, it's like, a uh, you know, in our shop, it's one at a time, right? It's that one-on-one -on -one yeah. taste. Off. But what we started doing is actually reaching out to bigger groups. Sorry, um, we have two uh, Yorkies that are uh, off you right now. Sorry. So we we actually were going to uh, libraries and doing presentations uh, to anywhere from twenty five to one hundred and fifty people, and bringing videos, bringing you know the you know the, the sample of the pod, and sort of showing people what this is all about. And um, that was really effective, but you know, it's so small and it does take time. Yeah. I don't know if there's a better way, uh, you know, but it takes more and more of us doing that, you know, and uh, with time, you know, some, something I, I, I wish I knew who said this because I thought it was interesting. Somebody I heard say one of the differences between uh, things like, let's say, craft beer and wine uh, versus chocolate is that chocolate's something that we all grew up with and it was whatever it was you know, in each of our lives, but it was that, you know, generic, you know, bulk product or candy. Uh, whereas, you know, things like beer and wine were, are, are generally adult decisions, right? So you come into this world and you say, okay, this is world of wines and there's a range of prices and I can go and experience them and, and make decisions based on my taste and my budget. Whereas chocolate is sort of left behind is this thing that is this, childhood memory comfort thing. I think that's a, a bigger hurdle to, to, you know, to get over. Um, so it is time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any more magic to it than that, but yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Morning is nothing to add. <laughs> and, and thank you. This was, this was phenomenal to, 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 to see and hear and learn more about, you know, how, how you got started and, and what's really happening on the ground. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so Amy, I think, you know, to summarize, then it sounds like, you know, I mean, pricing is definitely a key hindrance, I would say that people if they, you know, if they're familiar with the grocery store brands, they may not know what the difference is or why it's worth paying more. Um, and then, you know, of course, just the education around it as well. So <laughs> hi, Harding, showing your, showing your snacking to Chow as well. Thank you. Any other comments or questions we'd love to open up the floor all right well with that we will definitely we'll we'll stop recording and we'll just um feel free to hang to come on and hang out hang out and turn on your uh Turn on your camera if you'd like, but we'll stop recording.